So this one might, this one might, <laughs> this one might come as a surprise, huh? One of the, I, I have to say during this, this whole experience of whatever's happening on this global level, I, uh, I've definitely been thinking more and enjoying thinking uh, more again um, for, the, for the first time in a while. Um, and articulating, right? And on the fly and um, sort of an interesting thing. I, I've been taking to Twitter a bunch. I, I really love the form of Twitter and I could, I could go on about why I love the form of Twitter, um, not necessarily the experience of being on Twitter, uh, but one of, um, uh, of course, one of the things I love is the, is the speed. And, uh, but one thing that comes out is I, I, I think it sounds like I'm making these declarations when in fact, um, you know, my posture towards things I say it's always tenuous, right? It's always a proffering. It's always a theory. It's always a possibility. You know, I, I'm not interested in being right. I'm interested in the process of, of thinking, how I got from point A to point B. Um, so in that spirit, I, I, I want to talk about something that really struck me super hard uh, yesterday, uh, most of the day, most of the night. Um, and it's, it's about uh, witnessing what it is to bear witness, what it is to um, see somebody else, right? And the terms of the gaze with which we see, you know, what a, a very popular thing we talk about is the male gaze and the phallocentric gaze, the gaze that looks to own, the gaze that looks to uh, subvert, the gaze that looks to, you know, penetrate. Um, uh, but of course, the, the gaze is, um, and this was the great insight John Berger had in Ways of Seeing, is that the gaze is always, uh, it's not neutral, right? How we see is itself, um, it's not a given. It's not a given, right? We, we can teach ourselves to see a certain way um, and we are taught certain ways to see and we can unlearn those ways and we can learn new ways. And so one, one way I'm interested in um, comes to me from a contemporary uh, Israeli um, artist and, and psychoanalyst theorist philosopher, Braca Ettinger, who got referred, who uh, I heard about through, through uh, a friend of mine in New York, uh, Kat Mandeville, and um, it's been one of the more profound influences in my life, um, but I, I want to say this is in no way uh, me giving you Braca Ettinger's <laughs> toe. I'm just saying it's another influence because she writes a lot about what she calls the matrix seal gaze. And I'll talk about that in a minute. Um, and uh, uh, what it is to witness something. Um, and it's, it's complex and it's deep and it's resonant and it opens up a lot of stuff uh, more than I feel comfortable opining about. Um, so I'm gonna just say I'm stealing certain fragments that I took from her book um, and, and, and deploying them. Um, and I'm also gonna invoke the wire. Um, as many people know, I, I'm sort of obsessed with the TV show The Wire. I've seen it a bazillion times, but there's this moment, it actually comes up twice in the series, in which um, a character is, is instructed to use soft eyes. Uh, it's in one time, uh, a, a guy, a, a, a former cop is now in a classroom of a very difficult school, you know, a very poor neighborhood, um, almost exclusively, I think exclusively, um, you know, African-American and he's having some trouble with the students and one of the old teachers leans over to him and says, you need soft eyes. And that's all it says then. It comes up another time when um, uh, Kima, the, the up and coming uh, homicide detective, she used to be in narcotics and now she's going on her first homicide call and she's there with uh, Bunk, who's, you know, sort of the guru of, of, of homicide. Um, and uh, he, he says to her as they walk on the scene, you need soft eyes. And she's like, what is that? What are you saying to me? Some kind of Buddha shit. And she's like, come in with hard eyes. You'll focus. You, 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 won't, you, you won't take it in. You won't, you won't take in the scene. You won't let it come to you. You'll be looking for an answer. And that, I wrote a piece on this a long time ago. And it's, it's a figure that stays with me quite a bit. Um, this idea of soft eyes. Hard eyes are the eyes that look... Um, already knowing, they look to pierce, they're looking for something, right? They're directed, There's, they're, not, um, they're not taking in, right? One of the um, insane things about perception and about seeing is how much it's a give and take, right? Seeing necessarily happens in this middle space, in this middle place, in the in-between, 
Right? Uh, it was a, it was a, a, a heuristic I used to use for my students all the time to explain the middle voice. And I'd say to them, uh, is seeing active or passive? Right? When I look at, say, you know, my, my little glass of beer here, um, am, I, am I the agent seeing it? Well, that seems funny because, you know, I, I can't help but see it, right? In a way, I'm, I'm the one reduced, right? It's made me, you know, the... the, the <laughs> whatever the parlance of the time is, it has reduced me, it has made me, uh, subjugated me to it, right? Uh, you know, Merleau-Ponty, uh, the French phenomenologist, says, you know, seeing is, happens in this middle place. It is this, what he calls it, a chiasmus, uh, uh, an intertwining, an intertwining of seer and seeing, right? That it's, that we kind of swap places at this infinite speed. I take up that glass of beer and it, it pushes into me, um, it's actually a great, it's a great exercise, right? If you really relax and, and begin to really make sense of vision and the act of seeing as this experience of being inundated by the world, it can be, it can really like freak your shit out, right? You're walking around, you're like, wh where am I, right? The whole world is here. The whole world is where I should be, right? I, I, I can see my arms, I can see my legs, but here, you're here. The world is here. The mouse, the computer, the beer are here where I am. I, in a way, you know, you can get this beautiful kind of uh, uh, manic uh, paranoia if you've been thinking about seeing as, a, as, as, as this passive experience of the world forcing itself on us. And of course, I can't help but see what's called the male gaze as an attempt to kind of undo that, right? It feels, feels like they're catching and they want to be pitching, right? So I'm going to look back. I'm going to try to own that thing through my eyes. Which just, you know, there are always smacks of desperation, that, that, that certain notion of a phallocentric gaze. Um, but, you know, there are other versions of that gaze that need not be always so uh, sexually dominant per se. It's the gaze of knowing. It's the gaze that the hard eyes, the hard gaze that seeks to cut and slice and, and get to something. When in fact, any, everything we look at, kind of comes to us, right? It, it, is, it is a panoply, it is manifold, it is multiple, it is an assemblage, it is a lot of things happening all at once, right? And we can, you know, with hard eyes, you know, which we have to deploy at some point, right? We, we scrape away, right? And we see the thing we're looking for. Um, where soft eyes sort of allow the world to happen, right? They come, you come to the world and let it take over your body. You let it possess you. Right? There's an incredible thing about perception, about vision in particular, is it really is a kind of possession. You know, I am possessed by the things I look at. Quite literally, they're in me. You know, and I think again that the, what we call the male gaze, or the phallocentric gaze, is the one that, 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 that so clearly feels insecure about that, right? That it tries to reverse it, wrest power, and penetrate back. Uh, in um, her book, The Matrixial Border Space, um, Braga, Braga Ettinger, um, this contemporary uh, Israeli, she's, a, she's an artist, painter, and, uh, and a psychoanalyst and a theorist. Um, she, she says, well, she, she proffers this different gaze that comes from the feminine, and she calls matrixial gaze. Um, and I didn't, I didn't know whence uh, this word, uh, matrix, matrixial, um, but I guess it, it comes from the uh, Greek, Greek word for um, Latin, I don't know, for uh, womb. Um, and it's, it's, it, it, it's, a, it's a gaze that comes again from the womb as opposed to from the phallus. And the womb is this kind of interesting space because it's a place in you but of the other, right? I mean, it's, that's what a womb is, right? And so she, she, she proffers this kind of looking, this gaze that is matrixial, that is a space where I'm here but you're here at, at, I'm, <laughs> in looking at you you become constitutive of me uh, and vice versa. Um, of course, what me is and what you is becomes something else also, right? Um, so it's not just these two firm egos you fold up with, I'm not shoving you up in me. It, this kind of transposition or transmutation, this transformation, this interbecoming, intrapersonal becoming takes place on, a, on, a, on levels that sort of, um, you know, happen, I would say, you know, uh, within the body without organs, right? The, the, the non-organized, the non-egotistical, the non-phallic body. Um, 
and it, uh, it is this kind of um, openness. Uh, you know, I, I imagine this matrixial gaze as being these soft eyes, open eyes, eyes that just let things come. Um, it makes me think about how I literally look at things. And I love the double meaning of look. I love that it's this very practical, physical act of looking. And I love that looking has come to mean, um, you know, our interpretive lens, right? Um, and the fact is we can never separate those things. You know, another great thing Merleau-Ponty says is the perception is always already stylized. Right? There's no pure moment of seeing the thing. It's always inflected through this metabolic body, right? And that itself has been constituted by a variety of things, ideological, historical, cultural, uniquely physical, right? My metabolism is different than yours. Um, and, you know, so it's, this act of looking is simultaneously a physical act and an interpretive act, an act of making sense, an act of processing. Um, and, you know, I think when I, when I look back on my life and how I perceived and how I've perceived the world, you know, I, you know, I'm a little, I'm a little, frankly, a little, I don't want to say dismayed. I, don't, I have no regrets about my life, but I was like, oh, fuck. I think I've had, led a lot of my life with a tendency to look very hard, have hard eyes, right? I, I, to be judgmental, you know, and I think, uh, I think my students probably felt this a bunch, right? Um, I, I, I come back at them hard uh, with certain, you know, comebacks when they would try to offer an opinion or an idea. And I, only imagine the women in my life um, and my poor son and um, and I've been trying to train myself to have softer eyes but it's hard I think it, it is a real practice right to teach myself to see different and one thing I that really grabbed me yesterday that really just um, you know floored me was thinking about the act of seeing somebody else with pure generosity. Imagine looking at somebody and they're talking to you and you're not judging anything they're saying. You're, you love, it's not that you, you do, you love it all. It doesn't mean you like everything, right? But, but all that's irrelevant, right? Let that, that all fade into the background and just being absolutely present to someone. It's so difficult because A, we're trained to not see that way, and we're, and we're trained to not be seen that way. So that I've found that when I've tried to sort of see with, with soft eyes, with this matrixial gaze, it often, um, it's often met with some resistance and some discomfort. And that's not the other person's fault, it's a discursive problem, it's as much mine as it is theirs, it's not really a problem, but it is this thing that's not so easy to accomplish. Imagine simply bearing witness to somebody else free of judgment, free of judgment, just letting everything they're doing happen and, and seeing it, perceiving it, not turning a blind eye to it, but, 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 but witnessing it, witnessing it. Um, there's an incredible power simply in the act of witnessing, of seeing something, not just with somebody, but seeing that person, bearing witness to them, not as his ego, not as Daniel Coffey, not as this you know, kind of, you know, douchey, all-knowing, you know, Jewish fucking whatever the hell I am, right? But just in, in a kind of non-egotistical way, a pre-ego way, this kind of softer, um, more nebulous. It's really closer to a body without organs, right? It's more disorganized, but it's receptive um, to, to the swirl of another body, right? And the incredible, staggering power of that. I think I've spent a bunch of the last few years be trying to sort of um, ground myself to be a little more, um, uh, I hate the word centered because I don't believe in the center, but a, a little more unto myself, a little less outside myself, a little less pandering, a little less at the mercy of other forces. Um, and, you know, one form, of course, this takes is, is meditation. But it occurs to me, um, and this really came up a lot when I, I was seeing a, um, this this ridiculously brilliant man, uh, psycho, he was a former psychoanalyst who had sort of dispensed with psychoanalysis. He was in his 80s um, and, you know, had, had taken on other other beliefs 
Um, but one thing he used to say to me all the time, you know, his refrains were great. No matter what I said to him, he's like, Daniel, he's a Jewish, old Jewish guy from New York. Uh, Daniel, you're making a problem. There's no problem. What's the problem here? I'd be like, well, no, I don't know this woman. I don't know if she wants to be with me. He goes, either she does or she doesn't. You want to be with her? Be with her. You don't want to be with her? Don't be with her. What's the problem? Um, it, it was fantastic. I mean, it even got quite profound because I, I went in there. I first started seeing him after my sister had died and I, I found myself incapable of, of oh, you know, doing anything other than crying hysterically uh, and hyperventilating. And he, first thing he said to me is, oh, it's so beautiful. Oh, wow, it's so beautiful. So beautiful she died. So beautiful she lived. So beautiful you got to witness both. One of his great refrains to me was, um, love yourself. And when I realized, he's like, treat yourself like, like you would treat your baby, right? Just, you know, I mean, I mean, the fact is I treat my baby not so well. It's a little too judgmental. Stop crying. Um, that's how I was trained by my loving parents. Um, but uh, imagine um, looking at yourself with soft eyes, with that matrixial gaze, right? Imagine rather than grounding yourself and then ready to move into the world, you sort of undo yourself and witness yourself. I, mean, I, I suppose this is what meditation is tr trying to do, is teach you that sort of, you know, they say uh, the meditative eyes is the sky as opposed to the clouds, right? The clouds pass, and those are your moods and your thoughts. But your consciousness um, is the sky. And that's the thing you want to see. You want to see from that perspective, see that sky. Um, you know, so it's one thing to begin to try to see yourself with soft eyes, right? I mean, I, I, I was talking to a friend just last night um, and you know, she's going through some things and her instinct was really to beat up on herself. It was ridiculous, you know, things were failure, things, she's gonna be, you know, she's embarrassed in front of her parents, she's embarrassed in front of friends because of something that happened. And it was so conspicuous from, me, from my perspective, right? That this was just self-loathing. There was no, nothing really had happened here. I mean, there was a lot of drama in her life, but Nothing really judge, judgment worthy, you know, she didn't murder anybody. I mean, um, and while that's just a test case, that's, you, you need to see that with soft eyes too. That's a different question. <laughs> uh, and, and Breaking Bad does a great job in, in, in trying to reckon that in Jesse's um, recovery program. Um, but I could see how much you're just beating yourself up. And then it just made me think how much we all beat ourselves up so much of the fucking time. And, uh, and then we take that to the world, right? And so I suddenly saw the, the phenomenal power, the phenomenal education, the phenomenal transformation of being able to, um, to suddenly be able to see another person with truly soft eyes, with a matrixial gaze, with this sort of pre-subjective, or maybe a-subjective, um, mode of becoming that is simply receptive as opposed to those hard cutting eyes that define so much of let's say Twitter, so much of internet comments, so much of the world, so much of people, so much of my relationships with, with women, right? Is us judging each other. Um, I, 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 you know, I, 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 I am blown away by the unbelievable transformative power of, of bearing witness, of co-becoming, with, with other people, 